Hardy here at WVU. And first, I would like to introduce Dr. Olivia Jones. She's the lead curator at Grave Creek Mound Archaeological Complex and an adjunct instructor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and she will read our land acknowledgement this today. West Virginia University, with its statewide institutional presence, resides on land that includes ancestral territories of the Shawnee, Lenape, Haudenosaunee, Cherokee, and many other indigenous peoples. In acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate those indigenous nations whose territories we are living on and working in. Indigenous peoples have been in the land currently known as West Virginia since time immortal. It is important that we understand both the context that has brought our university community to reside on this land and our place within this long history. We also recognize that colonialism is a current ongoing process and as scholars seeking truth and understanding, we need to be mindful of our participation in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. So we would like to welcome everyone to this, our um, final lecture of the WVU School of Art and Design Visiting Artist Scholar Lecture Series for 22-23. Um, we do ask you silence your phones at this time. The J. Bernard Schultz Endowed Lecture um, in art, art History is named in honor of art historian and Dean Emeritus of the College of Creative Arts, Dr. Bernie Schultz. We would like at this time to thank our donor, who prefers to remain anonymous, for supporting the wonderful speakers, um, addressing important art historical topics that we've had in the past, the present, and in the future. And now I would like to introduce my colleague, Professor Megan Light, who will introduce today's speaker. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome our Schultz lecturer this afternoon, Dr. Marie Nicole Pereja Cummings, who goes by Doc or Nikki. She is an archaeologist, an art historian, and anthropologist who currently serves as a consulting scholar for the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Anthropology and Archaeology. She is also an assistant professor at Marshall University in classical archaeology and religious studies. Nikki earned her MA and PhD from Temple University, focusing first on Minoan tripod cooking vessels and then on Bronze Age Minoan and Cycladic iconography. While finishing her first book in 2017, titled Monkey and Ape Iconography in Aegean Art, her interest shifted beyond the Aegean Islands to include ancient Egypt, Anatolia, the Levant, Mesopotamia, the Indus River Valley, and beyond. Her talk today addresses Bronze Age Aegean wall paintings depicting monkeys from Crete and Thera, which shows the animals in a variety of roles, including wild or possibly trained monkeys, they may be cultic or sacred. While stylistically Aegean, these images are related to Egyptian and Mesopotamian iconography. To better understand these stylistic relationships, primatologists from around the world were consulted to identify any visible characteristics of particular species. This approach results in a new contributing source for monkey iconography, the broader Indus Valley. Communication and collaboration with Indus and Mesopotamian specialists has proved critical for this project, which facilitates the tracing of possible Indus-Aegean trade routes via the movement of iconography, raw materials, goods, and even people, specifically through ADNA and dental calculus analysis, while also considering textual documentation and color theory. We would like to say that archaeology is one of the few fields in which transdisciplinary learning is strongly encouraged and facilitated via fieldwork experience, and art history is one that interfaces beautifully with that field. Such work is often necessitated with applications for funding, and um, we know that these are in short supply for undergraduates. To remedy this, Nikki has actually built a nonprofit to serve the needs of undergraduates who are serious about pursuing specifically work in the prehistoric world. So we encourage you to think about addressing this with Dr. Cummings um, after the lecture today. So she is dedicating the latter part of, her, part of her talk, though, to discussing opportunities and strategies to undergraduates who were beginning field work and excavations, researching overseas, and many ways to earn grants and scholarships to do this. Please welcome Dr. Uh, Nicole Cummings. Thanks. Thanks. 
thank you, Dr. Light, for your kind introduction. Uh, and thank you guys for coming out to hear me speak today. I know it's the end of the semester. Oh, we have so many papers. We have so much homework. And taking another hour out of your day can seem like a lot sometimes. I do want to request respectfully for you students, please shut your laptops. I have a very short attention span. I promise this lecture will be on YouTube. You can always reference it later. I have a really short attention span, and if I think that you are shopping online, my brain jumps to, what are they getting? Can I have one too? How cool is it? When did it come out? And I will forget what I'm doing up here as your lecturer. So if you don't mind, I promise this will be on YouTube for you. Um, I'm also asking because I love having interaction. I hate hearing myself talk. Believe it or not, as I stand up here mic'd, getting ready to just talk at you. Um, so when I ask questions to you, I am genuinely asking for, for your interpretation, for what you're seeing. I'm looking for feedback, okay? Um, believe it or not, I'm not just up here to be a dancing monkey. We're gonna start in the Aegean. So if you've never really gotten a look at what the Aegean is before, it is this area. We're just north of the island of Crete. We're just east of the mainland in Greece, and we're just west of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. The islands that we're gonna focus on specifically today are Crete and Thera. So Crete is down there, we're circled, it's very large. Um, and then Thera is our really small island that's located just, just north. By the end of this lecture, we are going to have moved from this to this in terms of the span of what we are talking about. So today is going to be a bit of a sprint. I hope you're well rested. Okay, here we go. So starting at the very beginning, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, uh, review to make sure that we're all on the same page about what constitutes monkey and ape iconography. So we're gonna start in the very beginning of the early Bronze Age. Uh, we're talking mm, 3000 BC-ish. Um, what you see up here is a little figurine. We think it's an ape. Spoiler alert, the difference between apes and monkeys. Does anybody know? Anybody super into monkeys? Oh, I think I see a hand. Yes, do you remember which one is which? Excellent, yeah, so monkeys have tails and apes don't. So just because we can't see a tail up here, we can't see a tail on this figurine, we think it's an ape. If you flip this little figurine, and it is a little guy, if you flip him over, you can see here on the very bottom, uh, we have in, in size decoration, the decoration, a lot of people look at it and they say it's lions, I beg to differ, it looks like baboons to me, but I see monkeys everywhere, so maybe I'm not the person to ask. If we look really closely, you can see there's a hole that runs right through the shoulder of this little guy, so he probably would have been used as a bead, and then you could stamp that kind of seal impression onto clay or wax or what have you, um, kind of like a signature. And we think a lot of our early monkey small little figurines or seals look very similar. Um, what's really cool about this is we see this in Egypt too. So what are some of the similarities that you see between these two figurines? Hit me. Yes, this pose is so important to who monkeys are and, and how we represent them in art. I mean, anytime, anytime you go to the zoo, you probably see little monkeys, right? Crouching down, the, they're not quite sitting like people. This like seated squat, absolutely. Do you guys see anything else that's similar? Hit me. They both have a pronounced snout, good. So we, we're getting facial um, features. There's one more, all the way in the back. that there could be a hole in the guy on the right? Oh, maybe, there could be. I haven't gotten to see this one in person yet. When they give me permission, I'll let you know. Uh, the last thing I'm looking for is general color. So we have a little bit of weathering and aging on the image that we see on the left there, where he's a little bit more orange, but he's made out of um, ivory. So having these two white figurines, why is this so important? Because we think during this period in the early Bronze Age, there's a lot of trade and exchange and communication going on between Egypt, which has monkeys, as we know, and Crete. One of the important parts of studying monkey and ape imagery uh, is being able to acknowledge that we don't know of any monkey or ape remains from any of the Aegean islands, Crete or the mainland. 
There are no indigenous species to any of these regions. So where are they seeing monkeys? Where did they come from? Well, everyone's knee-jerk reaction is, we know they're trading with Egypt, Egypt is nearby, must be Egypt. So for now, stick that in your brain bank, we're gonna come back to that. We not only have single figurines, these little guys, but we have double figurines where they sit back to back. And again, this is something that we see both in Egypt and in Crete. Uh, and you'll notice they have a little hole just behind their little necks here and the bottom would be flat. The bottom of this one is blank, so I didn't show that to you. Now, we have 13, only 13, of these figurines in total. Most of them look like this, but there's one who doesn't. What's different? One of these things is not like the other, right? What's different, hit me. Yeah. Excellent, yeah, so he's, he's not, or he or she, or they, um, are crouched, they're not crouched down kind of on their heels, instead they're seated upright, almost like a human, right? So between that and being propped up just here on a little platform, this is something else. So, um, do we have any archeology span students in here, anthropology students in here? Oh yes, we got some hands, okay. so. When you're looking through a body of archeological material, how do you start trying to make sense of it if it's all just in a jumble together? You usually start by kind of sorting it out, right? Oh, you, you know, you put all the monkeys that look like this in that pile and all the monkeys that look like that in that pile. Well, if we don't have enough monkeys to put with this guy to make any general statement about him, what do we do? We, we don't talk about him. So, unfortunately, we're gonna see this with a few objects today. So, keep this little fella and that symbol you see on the very bottom of the, just down here, about very bottom of the seal, keep that filed away in your brain. We're gonna come back to it. Okay, so as we keep moving through the Bronze Age then, we get to the Middle Bronze Age and all these little figurines kinda of disappear. They have their moment, everyone sees them, um, and then, then they're just kind of gone. In Egypt, we keep having figurines, but what's really cool is the, the figurines start being blue, being purple. Sometimes they still are white, but we see a real shift where no longer do we have these kind of generalized baboon kind of figures um, in white. But as we get this shift into different colors, different representations, we see them doing different things. They're still in our seated monkey pose, but now they're doing these different things. It's important because these are representations of Toth. Has anyone here into ancient Egypt? Seen Moon Knight, maybe? I know. Who's Toth? Oh, hit me. Yes, the Egyptian god of knowledge, of writing. He's a messenger. He's a deity of music, if you will, poetry, storytelling, um, secrets. That's a really big one secret, secret knowledge. So you see, he's got, kind of got this whole personality. Why are we talking about this? This is another one of those things I'm gonna ask you to file for now. We're gonna come back to it. While this is happening down in Egypt, let's bounce back up to our Aegean islands. In the islands, we see these little seals, little stones, and we have um, monkeys carved into them. Now, before you get excited, this is not a monkey with a ponytail. This is almost always a question I get about this guy. It's an excavation scar. So. Uh, when someone was using a sharpened trowel, kind of like dug under him, you can see how it caught and then turned as they pulled this out of the soil. So this here is not a ponytail. Um, here's our little monkey. Again, in that seated posture. The type of stone we're seeing it on is carnelian. So it's this reddish, orangish, really gorgeous stone that was used a lot in the ancient world. Um, what else? I think that's good. Ah, and this one is about the size of your little fingernail. This is tiny. When we talk about seal stones, they're all pretty tiny. If they're not, I'll make sure I mention it to you. So we're lucky because seal stones, being so tiny, preserve imagery really, really well. So we can start looking for patterns. Oh my gosh, here we are, we're back to sorting. So when we start looking for patterns, we see monkeys appear pretty often, together with flowers, together with women, and together with baskets. So if you've never seen an Aegean seal before, 
there are a lot of different styles. Here we've got a monkey in the very middle of this image. We've got a woman wearing a dress, or a female figure wearing a dress, a nude female figure, and then there are a bunch of smaller things in the sky. We can't quite figure out what they are, if they're part of the background. Um, they could have, uh, on some seals, they're kind of eroded. But you know, you kind of, you start to get the hang of reading these images as we go, right? So if we keep looking at more and more and more of these seals, there are 35 of them in total as of right now that show monkeys. And I, it just, it really does, it pans out really well, right? So we hear again, monkey, basket, woman, flower, here's another basket, except, oh boy, I know it tells you, but what do you see? What's the problem with this one? Yeah, there's a dude. We've got a guy in there, well, okay, so, he doesn't really, he doesn't really fit the narrative of girl, monkey, basket, flower. So what are we gonna do with it? Throw it out. Well, don't actually throw it out. We just don't talk about it that much, right? Not when we're talking about monkeys, not when we're talking about these scenes. And this is uh, an unfortunate reality. Um, okay, so we have these seals. Creating these seals continues throughout the Bronze Age. So for the next couple of thousand years, this continues happening. But we have this really important moment that starts right in the middle of the Middle Bronze Age, so smack dab in the middle of the Bronze Age. Uh, we get this fluorescence of wall paintings. Have you guys studied any of these Aegean wall paintings in your classes before? I'm keeping my fingers and toes like crossed here for your, like, oh yes, in survey, we, is that kind of, <laughs> I heard, oh yes, I'll take it. Yeah, so what's really cool about these wall paintings is now we're moving from teeny little objects where you've really got to kind of squint to get into the details to having an entire room where we can see the way that these monkeys are represented. So in this case, we've got monkeys, and I know they're kind of hard to see. Um, this is the only reconstruction that's available of this room, so forgive me with this drawing here. Uh, so we've got monkeys in a flying gallop pose. Ooh, did you guys learn that one in art history? Flying gallop, it's like Superman pose. What does it represent? What is Superman doing when he's like flying with his arms out? You fly slow. That would be a nightmare. Well, I hope you're zooming around, right? So flying gallop should mean fast, should mean strong, could be all those things that you want. So when we have a monkey represented in flying gallop, that's what we're seeing. So we've got our monkey back here in flying gallop pose. Uh, we've got another monkey over here smelling flowers, a few of them are smelling flowers. We've got a monkey down here, H5, if you trace him back to the wall, he's eating an egg, he's a naughty monkey, because he's eating the eggs of the birds that are really upset, that are flying around, this really nice luscious landscape. And then last but certainly not least, we've got a monkey back here who is clinging to papyri for dear life. Do any of you, by any chance, watch animal videos? when you can't sleep. Oh, you're on YouTube, you know, you're to the point where you're like dropping your phone on your face, but you have to see the next cute kitten. So I do that with monkeys. And one of the most popular type of monkey videos are drunk monkeys in the Barbados, people, the monkeys stealing uh, tourist stuff. Some of our earliest evidence for monkeys drinking alcohol comes from the ancient period, especially in Egypt, where we know monkeys would sock away different fruits and go back once they start fermenting. I, this is not what you thought you were gonna learn today, is it? Yeah, so this could be one of the first times that we see this in art, which is actually really exciting because that means that we all know about it, we just haven't seen it in art yet, if we know what we're looking at. Now these guys, oh, so near and dear to my heart, I love these guys. If we look at them closely, I want you guys to notice the difference between the original fragments and what's been reconstructed. So our original fragments are the parts that look kind of gritty, kind of kind of dark. Uh, they can be a little bit difficult to read. And the areas that look more almost pastel, that's all reconstruction. <sighs> totally changes the way you look at this image, doesn't it? So over here on the left, we've your left, yes, your left, we've got some, we've got some pretty well-preserved monkeys, right? Well, one well-preserved monkey. We have almost the whole body here. Over here, we've got some good body. Over here, we've got a good amount of body. By the time we get to this last monkey on the upper right, we got a little bit of tail 
an elbow, and some fingertips. So when it comes to viewing reconstructions, remember to read them with a grain of salt. We can only do what we can do with the pieces that we have. However, I want you guys to pay attention to the fact that these monkeys are huge. This is, this wall painting itself probably runs from about, I'm six feet tall to give you some, some scale, from about my knees to somewhere between my shoulders and my ears. Here are my ears. Um, so this is big, especially compared to the seals that we were just talking about, right? So if we're gonna study these, we have to look at the fragments that we have that are original, not our reconstructions. And when we do that, we find something really cool. I get goosebumps every time I talk about this. So we're supposed to be getting these monkeys from Egypt, right? Now, how many of you have seen Egyptian art? Whether it's in art class, whether it's at a museum, whether it's in some kind of pop culture, at Moon Knight, whatever, right? You have a vague idea of what Egyptian art looks like. And in Egyptian art, do we have a lot of individualism? I hope most of you are like, no. No, we don't, right? If we're gonna show, let's say, monkeys, it's monkey, monkey, monkey. If you look at their faces, what do you see about these monkeys? They have very round eyeballs. Yes, they have different facial markings. So we're seeing, and I know you guys are like, why is she so pumped? We're gonna get there. We're seeing different individualized monkeys, which means odds are these monkeys were seen in person by the artist. But that's not possible, remember, because we don't have any monkeys that live there, unless we're importing them from Egypt, we're going to Egypt, seeing them making sketches, coming back and then painting them on the walls. But in any case, there's more observation going on of live monkeys than we had previously realized. Ah, oh, that's cool, right? At least we know we're not copying another piece of art that came out of Egypt for these representations. Ah, oh, that's okay. A, lot, a few of these last uh, wall painting fragments that we have, I think we have four more wall painting fragments to get through kind of quickly here. This one, we don't have much to go on. It's a smaller scale uh, wall painting, but we think we have a couple of monkeys, some architecture, a seated woman, some people call her a goddess, uh, some birds, we think they're rock doves. It's a fancy word for pigeon, pigeons. Um, and maybe a little bit of stonework, rock work in the background. All right, now this next one. This is really important, so this image and the next image go together. But so that we don't lose the details, I'm gonna give them to you in two separate slides. So you've got the original image on top, you've got the little line drawing on the bottom to help you see it a little bit more clearly. What do you see? I'll give you a hint, it's written up there. We see a monkey playing a harp. Who in their right mind would give a monkey a harp? Right? Much less, one that's gold. That's painted, well, okay, maybe we're misunderstanding the yellow color. Maybe it's not gold, maybe it's wood, but it's painted in yellow. What else do you see? There's a monkey with something that could be a sword. So this is the thing that trips us up a little bit, if you check it out right here. It looks like a sad balloon, right? We think maybe, maybe this is the way that they were painting tassels because that's, that's kind of a tricky thing to paint, right? So it could be tassels, tassels at the end of a long scabbard. So if you can see these dark loops here, these represent like the part that would be tied to your belt so that you can, you know, you know what a scabbard is. I'm seeing some like blank stairs. Scabbard being the like, the thing that you put the sword back into so it's like sits at your hip. Okay, track in now, there we go. All right, uh, and last but not least, what is this? Can you see up here? It's right next to the monkey's face. What is that? It's, it's round, it's not quite a horn, that's a good guess. It's an earring, I don't know where that came from, but yes. Yeah, it's an earring. Is that a pirate monkey? Well, we've heard of stranger things, right? I mean, when it comes to monkeys, they're almost a token critter for sailing the seven seas, travel, getting into trouble, certainly. Uh, maybe it's a coincidence. So the other half of this image then, if we, if we imagine this coming just to the right of that last fragment, uh, we can see that we have a monkey with a sword, but all we have left is from about here up, 
holding that sword. And then we've got another monkey represented who could be clapping, could be uh, maybe holding like castanets. You guys know those clickety clack little finger guys? Uh, could be holding castanets, could be holding some other kind of percussive instrument. We're not sure. But these four make a scene, so it's almost like we have musical folks to either side, and in the very middle, dancing, maybe battle? We're not quite sure. And this is our crowning jewel from Akrotiri. This is one of the best preserved wall paintings. And oh man, this thing gets a lot of attention in, in academia in terms of articles and books and theories and, and what have you. So for the purpose of what we're doing today, we're not gonna go all the way down that rabbit hole. We're just gonna walk through what we see first. So first and foremost, we see a young girl here wearing a kind of a special garment. We think it's, it's for special occasions. She's dumping out a basket full of flowers into a bigger basket from which presumably our blue monkey who's standing up here on these hind legs took some little pinches of what occurs in the very, very middle of these flowers. Now, if I tell you these flowers are crocuses, do you know what this monkey is getting from the very middle? Did I tell you up there? Oh good, I didn't. What grows in the middle of crocus flowers? It is one of the most expensive spices ever. Yes, saffron. Why is saffron important? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I see a lot more blank faces again. Um, not just for flavorings, not just for seasonings, but what constitutes medicine in the ancient world? Oh yeah, plants and some other stuff. You know, magic, animal bones, things like that. Uh, but for the purpose of what we're seeing here, people have interpreted this image as being one of healing or some kind of healing ritual where the monkey is handing off the saffron to what we think is a massive seated goddess. Why is she a goddess and not a woman? Because she's so big. If she were to stand up, her head would blast through the upper border that we see here. And the taller you are, the more powerful you are. Did I mention I'm six feet tall? Yeah. Uh, and then right behind her, we've got a griffin. So here's our griffin. Uh, winged, legs of a lion, face of an eagle, falcon, raptor, ra not dinosaur raptor, but like bird raptor. Okay, just got to clarify. I've had some weird conversations with folks. Um, and then here along the background in this reconstruction, you can see what we can't really see very well in the wall painting itself and the fragments that survive. The entire background is covered in crocus flowers, clumps of crocus flowers that we think would have been growing somewhere in the surrounding environment. Now what's really, really cool about this is that saf saffron comes from crocuses that really only bloom during maybe two weeks in October. There's this wild crocus that grows on the island of Crete in particular. And so on the walls around that last image, we have scenes of collecting and harvesting the saffron. So it's that important that we're putting it in these huge wall paintings that are painted using really expensive, really luxurious um, pigments. Some from far distant places, like the brighter blue colors that we have here used for this girl's scalp, for this part of her clothing. Um, the, those really nice vibrant blues are coming out of Egypt. That's, that's quite a way, ways to go for a little bit of blue paint for your wall, right? I mean, I'm hard pressed to go past Lowe's for wallpaper. So one of our last images here, before we're up to date and we're speeding along on our little theories, uh, is this guy, which is, I think, one of the very first images of monkeys discovered. Uh, it was first discovered by the fellow who excavated the site of Knossos, in the early 1900s, his name is Sir Arthur Evans. And what you see up here, just like those other images, we have darker, kind of harder to see fragments. Those are the original fragments. And then anything that's a little bit lighter is gonna be what's reconstruction. So again, we're going from very few fragments. And I know, I can hear your thoughts. Doc, there are only fragments showing two monkeys upstairs. And then on the bottom, you've got three monkeys. Yeah, I know. It's because I got into the museum and I was able to tell that we have, we do in fact have, more than two monkeys in the fragments. This reconstruction that you can actually see in the Heraklion Museum if you were to go mm, tomorrow, I hope you all go at some point, it's not accurate because they don't have all of the fragments that they have that are cleaned, that we can study. Some fragments are still left in the storeroom. So we know there, there's at least one more monkey available. Now what do you see that's different about these monkeys that we haven't seen in the other images? 
Hit me. They're not interacting with humans. Good, we're seeing baskets, we're seeing flowers, but what's different? Yeah, they're scampering around more. They, you know, they kind of look more like monkeys instead of monkeys doing what humans want them to do. But they're also wearing something that we've all argued about. They're wearing, be yes, be belts, wherever that came from. Belts, or maybe it's a harness? So it's a little tough to see on the original fragments. I promise they're there. But we can see something at the neckline. We can see something on the upper arms, at the waist, sometimes even at the wrist. Is this like... Is this some kind of, mm, you know, you put your dog on its harness, you take it to the dog park, you let it run loose, and then you bring it home, and you hook it up to the harness again. Is this that? Are these pets? We had a monkey with an earring. Is this adornment? Are these guys wearing like, like monkey jewelry? Is this a thing? We don't know. Well, when we don't know what to do with something, what do we do? We don't talk about it. File this away. All right, so speaking of things we don't know what to do with, what do we do? How do we approach this idea that we're seeing the same pattern, like you guys just brought out, we're seeing the same pattern in wall paintings that we're seeing in these little seals, it's just bigger. So, girls, monkeys, baskets, flowers. Girls, monkeys, baskets, flowers. One step further, look at the composition. What do you see? Yeah, it's the same. So my question then becomes, is what we're seeing in these little seals, are these just like the little, com what are those little comic book windows called? You know what I'm talking about? You read in a comic book, everything's broken down to little windows. Are these, thank you, panels. Yes, my art students. Okay, so are, are our seals, panels, and our wall paintings, the comic books? You see where I'm going with this, right? Because they match up. They jive. Is there some bigger story that's lost to us because we also don't know how to translate the text that we have from this period? Is there some story that we don't know yet or that is long lost to us that would perfectly describe what we're seeing? I don't know, it's a good question, except we have some outliers where things don't quite make sense. So from what we know so far, monkeys help gather flowers. Monkeys offer flowers to seated goddesses. What is wrong with this image? So we got a monkey on your right, next to a really big flower. And here's so much, the monkey's on a chair. Monkeys don't sit on chairs. Wait, do they? Oh, remember that stuff we threw out? Remember that first seal with the monkey seated upright? Eh, maybe it's a coincidence. In any case, some people still argue about this image, and they go, mm, well, maybe it's fake. We don't really see monkeys seated upright. We don't really see them receiving people. I mean, it's seated on what looks like a camp stool or something, you know. Uh, and it's got these, this weird little belt. We never see monkeys wearing belts, do we? Must be fake. So it's about at this point that um, I wanted to wrap up, I thought I was done with my PhD, all this research up until here. And one of my friends was at the Penn Library studying um, these little, have you ever heard of cylinder seals? Did you guys talk about those at all in your survey classes? They're like seals, they're like on these little rolly bits, there's a hole that goes right through the middle and you can like roll out your signature as opposed to stamping it. So she was looking, at Mesopotamian cylinder seals. And she goes, oh, you're looking at monkeys and like Aegean seals, you should see the ones we have in Mesopotamia. And I was like, oh man, here we go. So sure enough, what do you see? People approaching, someone who's seated on a raised platform, and what is this? Right smack dab in the middle. It's another monkey. It's another, so you can't finish your dissertation then, can you? 
well, I had to or I'd never finish it, so I finished it, called it a day, and was like, all right, well, this will be the book. So how far down the rabbit hole does this go? Now, the image that you're seeing the reconstruction of on the right, there's a lot of argument about its precise date. Ballpark, we're going to say 1500, 1550 BC. So when you then see that some of these other seals from Mesopotamia come from 500 years earlier, where's this idea coming from? Where's this image from? Where's this composition coming from? Maybe this isn't something that's just Aegean in nature. Maybe this, wait a minute, I thought we were only talking to Egypt. Maybe. Maybe that one cylinder seal was a one-off. Except, if you look closely at this one, look, here we go. I, okay, I know he looks a little bit like a hedgehog. I promise it's a baboon. So we've got, we've got one just seated right there in the middle. Yes, there's a bird too, but we still have our seated person. We've got our approaching figures. Yet again, approaching figures. Little monkey guy. Big seed, oh my gosh, here we go again. And this one's gotta be my favorite. So we've got a carnelian seal, we've got our approaching figures, our little monkey, and he's even being naughty. He's reaching for an egg or a bun, something off that table that belongs to the seated person here. Come on. So maybe when we look at this image, what we should be seeing is not, oh hey, look, some Aegean stuff. No, maybe we should be seeing this beautiful confluence of these three very big, very different cultures. And it just happens to be done in the Aegean, in Aegean artistic style, in a unique Aegean way. But there's, there's overlap, right? You guys are tracking so far. Do I still have you? No one's fallen asleep on me yet, have they? Oh, that's always the worst. Okay, where are we on time? So we're gonna step really lightly through these next few slides. So. If we go a little quickly, I don't know, look fast. Okay, it'll be on, it'll be on YouTube, you can pause it later. Uh, all right, so like I said, we're gonna sprint from our little world over here, and we're going to wind up all the way over here. So, what's in the middle? Mesopotamia. If we start by looking at the site of Susa, S-U-S-A, it is one of the coolest sites because it is nested right up against the Zagros Mountains, and there's this nice kind of little little valley area where we think there could have been caravans coming through from farther east, possibly. And one of the earliest things that we have from Susa that shows any evidence of monkey imagery, as you can see up here, is called a bulla. Do you know what these are? Have you ever learned about these? The little clay envelopes, um, little containers kind of. They're created basically like, you know when you send something through UPS and they give you that slip that's like, okay, if it gets lost in the mail, it's our fault, here's your tracking number, good luck. That's what this is. So like, let's say I'm sending you guys five bales of grain. Let's make it barley so we can make beer. So five bales of barley. Um, I'm gonna put these five tokens inside of this little envelope and then stamp it all over on the outside so that if anybody tries to get in there and take out a token, we're gonna know. Also, so that if while your goods are in transit and someone steals one of those bales, or maybe the person who is sending them is trying to make a little extra on the side, sells one of your bales of, of grain, when it gets where it's going, he hands it off and he says, oh yeah, dude only gave me four to send to you. You crack open this thing, and you see five tokens, and you're like, nah, bro. You know there's something up. That's the whole point of this. This is an object designed for travel. Ah, that makes sense, right? And it's covered in monkeys. How cool. It's also one of our earliest objects. So if you look down here, uh, the best that the Louvre would give me is the late fourth millennium BC for our date there. Now, this little guy, ah, not so particular. I feel like maybe my nephew could make this. Um, but he too is late fourth millennium, and he is also from Susa, so this is really important. Now this next part was a total mistake. I'm telling you, some of the best ideas you ever have are total mistakes. So I was getting ready to teach my survey art history course when I was at uh, Penn State University, and over here on the right is an image that is in almost every single introduction text that's to world art, not just Western art. So that happened to be out at the same time that I found this image of this little fella on your left. They're not exactly the same type of stone, but they're close. They're not exactly the same color, but they're close. They're not exactly the same style, but they're close. Could this be different workshops, same location? It's possible. 
the first time I looked at this, I thought, okay, this is definitely not a baboon. We see a lot of baboons coming out of, out of Egypt, right? Not a baboon. Could be some other kind of monkey. I have no idea where it would come from. So not being a primatologist and not knowing anything else about monkeys, this is what we got. As we move over and look at what we have in Egypt, di slightly different period, not the same. This is not something that we're seeing coming out of Egypt at all. So where is it coming from? That's a good question. What other kind of monkey imagery do we have? Again, we've got a little critter. It doesn't exactly look like a monkey. I think it looks like a really happy hamster. Um, <laughs> I promise it's a, it's a monkey or an ape uh, that we have on top of a hairpin over there on the very left. I love that little guy. We've got monkeys that are also um, like prey. They're being hunted. We can see that in some imagery. So here we have an elite individual uh, hunting the monkey in the tree as opposed to the boar on the ground. And then we've got these. There are eight of these in existence. There are only two that have been photographed. This is the only clear photograph that we have from the British Museum. And what do you know? We've got someone, probably male, because if you can tell the area that's, um, that's missing, that's been eroded away, that's been broken, that's where a beard should be. So we've got a male individual with two monkeys, one on his shoulder and one down here, and this monkey's on a leash. Ah, uh, it could be a coincidence, right? I know, we're dealing with a lot of coincidence-i, coincidence There are a lot of things happening randomly. Yeah, so, all right, so that's gotten us as far as Susa. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Remember this little fella? We didn't have, we didn't have a lot to compare him to, but now we've kind of been racking up these other examples, right? Now we're, we're really getting there. Pay attention to the symbol that is on his base. Because this is something that, yeah, mm, could be, is, you know, it's geo, geographic, geologic, geomorphic, geometric, geometric. Many different cultures could have made it before. But it's particular. It's, it's pretty identifiable. We call this the cross and chevron motif. And it's something that we can follow step by step if we start in the west the west here being the Aegean Islands. If we start in the west and move eastward, the farther eastward we go, the farther back in time we can identify this particular motif. So here we see it all over these little molds. These are from Anatolia or from modern day Turkey. If we continue going, um, Bactria, so I threw this in because it's a monkey and who doesn't love monkeys? So here we have one from Bactria from 3200 BC. Now you see how we're tracking ourselves backwards through time. And by the time we get all the way over to the Indus River Valley, here we go, we've got it in clay. And we're looking at 3600 BC. So not only are we moving through space, but we are also moving through time following this pattern. That's kind of a lot. Are you guys out of breath? You good? We're gonna keep going. We also have carnelian. So remember how jazzed I got about carnelian a little bit earlier? We were talking about it's orange, it's gorgeous, it's used in elite contexts. Um, carnelian really only comes, ah, high quality carnelian, uh, really only comes from these gorgeous mines in India, uh, in the Indus River Valley. And it's carved into these shapes, they have a very long name, called uh, elongated biconical beads. All that means is there's like a ridge in the middle and then it tapers and they're long, elongated, right? So we see this cool phenomenon where we know Mesopotamia was trading with the Indus. We know that, they've been doing it forever. That's not news to anyone, except to people who study in the Aegean because we don't look up really from what we're doing in the Aegean to talk to those around us. So it's really important we do that. Um, and that's kind of what shed light on the fact that these carnelian beads, as they move through Mesopotamia, are cut into smaller pieces so that you can upcharge as they're coming in, because the farther you get from the source, right, things get more expensive. So we're cutting them into smaller pieces. Sometimes we're even adding this motif, looks like a bullseye, right? Sometimes we're even adding that to some of these. And so far, the farthest west that we have found these beads is over here the island of Egina, and it comes from the very beginning of the early Bronze Age. Indus, Greece, the beginning of the Bronze Age. This is huge, right? 
So there's, there's kind of a complicated thing that we do need to talk about real quick. Um, if any one of these conclusions were the big conclusion that we would be talking about here today, it would be totally fair to go, ah, maybe it's a, maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it's a one-off, maybe you're reading too much into it. But when we start stacking these patterns that we're finding, there get, comes a point where it, it really can't just be coincidence, it really can't just be, hmm, maybe you're reading too much into it. You guys are still following me down, down the rabbit hole? Oh, we're not done. So speaking of primatology, um, are monkeys here? Remember how we talked about them? They could be from Egypt, they could not be from Egypt, we don't know, whatever. Um, so traditionally, it's been art historians and archeologists who have looked at this, looked at some pictures of monkeys and said, hey, they kind of look like these ones from Egypt, that must be what they are, these monkeys. These guys are little, they're like cat size. Sorry, this is not correct, this is correct. They're like cat size, oh, there's a baby. Their little tails are what most people notice. And so here you see our vervet kind of uh, Vervet is the name of the species. So the end of the tail kind of limp, kind of extended, and you can see that they are moving, they are active. They're not just sitting and chilling. So I got a team of primatologists from all around the world, shared with them all of the images that I shared with you today and some more and asked them to give me their ideas before they gave anyone else their ideas about what kind of monkeys we're seeing. And every single one of them said that they think these monkeys are Hanuman langurs. Well, they didn't say Hanuman, they said langurs. Langur is not the species, it's the genus, so step it back one, right? We're going with a general kind of taxonomic identification, which is really cool um, because they don't come from Egypt. Where do you think they come from? They come from India. India, Bhutan, Nepal, these guys are from so far away. So how on earth are we representing them in wall paintings so specifically that we can identify their taxa? This is so legit, guys. And I probably shouldn't say that on something that's being recorded and posted on YouTube, but it is true. So when it comes to doing things like this, we have to talk beyond just, just, our own specialty. We have to talk to specialists in other areas, whether it's other areas of archaeology, so Mesopotamia and Indus relations, whether it's primatologists, whether it's taxonomic illustrators, the people who do the cool like scientific drawings, those guys. Um, because we have so much information that when you put it together, we can get so much more out of the research that we're already doing. But I do need to throw out there a word of caution. When you decide to work with other people, you have to make sure that they know what they're talking about. How do you do that if it's not your field? Well, for instance, there are, um, for a project like this, I probably wouldn't ask someone who specializes in birds to help me identify these. I probably wouldn't ask someone who studies ancient uh, monkeys uh, in the New World to help me with this, right? New World being the Americas. But it happens, it does. So when you're making sure that you are getting good solid help, uh, make sure it's coming from the right sources. All right, so our last little monkey thing here, our last takeaway that I just, man, again, goosebumps. What do you see? This is a standing stone from outside a temple to Hanuman in India. Granted, it's from a few hundred years later. But what do you see? We got a monkey wearing jewelry? Do you see our belt? Oh man, what else do you see? What's it doing behind its back? I'll give you a hint, there's a tassel down here. Yeah, I hear you guys, it's a sword, it's a sword. Yeah, it's a sword. You can say it, you're right. So many, even down to our little earring, this is, we've got eyebrows on this little guy. Granted, not exactly depicted the same way, um, but we do, we have, we have earrings, for crying out loud. Okay, and I would love to keep going, but I also wanna make sure that we have time for questions. So if you guys want to know more, I'm very happy to talk to you about more. I'm gonna skip over some slides to get us to the thank you slide, and then we can do questions, a lot of slides, to get us to the thank you slide. There we go. Yay, thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for talking. 
Seriously, I can't tell you how many times I lecture and people just kind of stare. So thank you for being interactive. Thank you for talking. Do you guys have any questions? That was a sprint, wasn't it? Hit me. We just, we honestly, we don't have the, um, the fragment of his head, and so it's tough to say. So it's just because I haven't had a monkey shown looking down anywhere else in the authentic fragments of art, that's why I went with just putting him awkwardly staring at the ground. Yeah, good question, close looking. Hit me. Yes, the Minoan culture, absolutely. Yeah, so we've got our, our Minoan culture, and they're actually, um, the very first site that we are aware of that's been excavated is Knossos, where we find the, some of those wall paintings. Two of those wall paintings come from Knossos. So I guess my question is that, I believe the Minoan culture had this fascination with bull iconography. Bulls, yes. How does that, I guess, how does that compare with the southern culture? Like, from the Indus? Well, not even the Indus. Okay. That's a good question. So actually, monkeys are not represented nearly as frequently as bulls, um, as lions. There are a lot of other animals that are, are represented a lot more frequently, to the point that um, in some, ooh, some people argue, some scholars argue that we have, um, monkeys are used almost as this liminal, like intermediary figure between humans and the divine as opposed to lions, where we see lions more uh, maybe representative of um, the elites in terms of social hierarchies having more to do with like hunting and things that we keep think of as being reserved for elites. Whereas monkeys, I mean, they, they don't hunt. What do they do? They do kind of human things, they do kind of animal things. And so this, they're in a really great sort of position in the middle to be they're natural, but they're kind of like humans, and maybe maybe that kind of gives them a leg up to talk to deities or be interme intermediaries in that way. Um, but no, monkeys definitely have way less imagery than lions, than, um, yeah, than, than all kinds of animals, bulls, cattle. It's a good question. Yeah, maybe that'll be a next article. Thank you. Any other questions? Hit me. Mm -hmm. The other difference is the fact that, from what I can see, and maybe I'm misinterpreting this, is that the arms are actually separated from the body. Yes! Now that, to me, is the only one we found out there, where you, the other ones have that kind of distant connector. Mm -hmm. So, where does that fit? I mean, is it how do you interpret that, that those co concepts are so interrelated? Ooh. Okay, so I have, to, I have to give you a disclaimer and say this is speculation on my part. So there's not, um, as far as I know, there hasn't been anyone who studied this specifically in monkeys. However, um, I think the difference in gesture is really important because that's something, especially because we don't have the texts and we don't have stories. Well, we, we have texts, we haven't translated them. Um, and we don't have the stories. So a lot of what we're trying to understand, not just about monkeys uh, and other animals, but also about humans, has to do with gesture and trying to read meaning into the way that people are gesticulating. Traditionally, having hands out um, is more of a, either an accepting or a giving. It's some kind of transaction, right? So whether you are, um, let's see. So in ancient Egypt, right, we have, is one of the earliest places where we have this gesture. What is this gesture? Anybody? It's not, don't shoot. What's this gesture? It's, pr yeah, somebody said praying, right? So, so it's interesting because with this, it's hands out, it's like pushing, right? It's away from you, angled away from you, but to have it open and lower, that's something that we'd have to, I think, we'd have to look more into uh, what we see in terms of Mesopotamia, what we see in terms of Egypt. And I do know in Egypt, we have a lot of pharaonic statues. I am by no means an Egyptian specialist, so take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, we have a lot of pharaonic imagery where they've got one hand closed and one hand open. 
So it could talk about ways to, or it could address ways of engaging, more um, pacific ways of engaging, more peaceful ways of engaging as opposed to with might, uh, which is something that would factor in with what we see in terms of flowers and uh, offerings, that kind of thing. But again, total speculation, complete and total speculation on my part right now. So please, God, don't cite me. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys have any other questions? Thank you, yeah. Okay, so let's, oh boy, did I ruin this? Oh, I ruined it. That's okay, give me a second. Oh, okay, I got you, don't worry, I got you. Here we are. And then our little presentation mode, there we go. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks though, Megan. Um, yeah, so in terms of my nonprofit, and I'm not kidding when I tell you guys we are, we are growing our nonprofit, we are working really hard to make sure that this isn't something that only goes to students who work with me personally, although I love working with students. Um, coming up and wanting to go into a GN prehistory, knowing that this is something that I wanted to do, I was absolutely heartbroken that I could not afford to start to do any study overseas. I couldn't go to field schools when I was an undergrad because money just wasn't there. And I'll be honest with you, I am from the middle of nowhere, Indiana. Like, middle of nowhere. So it's not really like working at the corner shop was going to make me enough extra money to go overseas in the summer. Because of this, yeah, I started this nonprofit. Uh, we call it Abazi, which is short for the Aegean Bronze Age Study Initiative. Uh, and it focuses primarily on the Bronze Age, but also on any regions that are in contact with the Aegean, related to the Aegean. And after a bunch of the research that came out recently, pretty much that means anywhere in Afro-Eurasia. Yeah. Because some of, our, some of our best research is finding that we were all connected. Um, yeah, as far as, as the eastern shores of Asia, Southeast Asia, we now know that there were people eating bananas from Southeast Asia uh, in Mesopotamia because we were able to study their teeth. What? Yeah, all oh, this stuff is so cool. So this nonprofit um, is basically geared to help you do whatever you need to do to scratch that academic itch. If you go work overseas and you love it and this is what you want to do with your life and you want to go to grad school, okay, cool, reach out. We can hook you up with a mentor who can help you get there. We can hook you up with uh, funding to present some of that research that you just did overseas. Um, we can help fund any future research. If this is your first time, you want to go work on a, a field school, apply. We don't have hardly anyone applying right now. So, right? Um, and it's what's really something that you're not going to get in a lot of other funding entities, and I'm sure some of you will roll your eyes and go, oh man, we got to do more. Hear me out. How did you first hear about archaeology? If you say Indiana Jones, that's fine, but archaeology is something that um, it is one of the very few academic disciplines where people don't do this for a paycheck. Trust me. We do this because we are insane, because we love what we do. I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, and so because we love what we do, we want to make sure that enough other people are aware of what we're doing, how we're doing, what we are doing. Um, and there's this inherent responsibility to involve everyone in archaeology to make sure that what we're doing isn't something that's only being published in academic journals. Because what good is that to everyone else? Right? If you're not in it. Um, so part of Abazi is dedicated to outreach. So if you do receive funding, you may be asked to talk about that presentation we just gave you $3,000 to give at that conference. Can you do that again? in a few months for our conference that we do here, like our Abazi conference, so that donors can see where their money is going and so that local people, elementary school students, middle school students, high school students, other college students can hear what you're doing because it's cool. Yeah, so outreach is really, really big. So we don't limit outreach to local areas. We, yes, engage locally, but we also engage in Greece. So here's one of, uh, one of my colleagues setting up one of our, um, one of our excavations had a huge museum uh, exhibit. So if you're into museum studies, man, we got funding for you too. Just stay in contact, okay? And I'm, I know your profs will have no problem passing along my contact. Uh, our website was supposed to go live this week. 
uh, but my web person had a family emergency, so next week it will be live, in which case they will pass along the, <laughs> the website uh, information. So if you are at all interested in this and you wanna scribble down some deadlines for the next academic year, um, any presentation that you wanna do in winter or spring, we've got October 15th, this is forever away. Our turnaround is extremely fast because there are still so few people applying. Um, it does, not much of a decision, you know. Um, same thing with excavation. So because a lot of us don't hear back about whether we have the grants or the permission for us as a team to go excavate before fe February, I'm not gonna ask you to apply for funding before February. But this also, again, means I'll be able to turn around very quickly. And when I say I, I mean it's me and two other people doing this. You will know very quickly if you got it or not. Uh, when you have it. So, and then research grants, of course. And, and this is any kind of research. You wanna sit in the hole in the library all summer and read about blue monkeys? Oh man, you got that research. You'll get the funding, you know what I mean? So yeah, so anything that you wanna do, let us know, we'll find a way to help. Cool, all right, am I keeping you guys? Oh, we're five minutes over, sorry. Thank you for coming out. I know you gotta go to class. Don't fall out of contact. Send me emails. Do, do outreach. Reach out to me. Bye, guys.